and welcome to the latest episode of Betfair's Racing Only Better podcast ahead of the weekend's action. And I can't believe we're now in April and we're to- still talking about the bloody weather. I mean, honestly, weather may well scupper proceedings. We've obviously got ITV Racing from Kelso. They're taking four races from there on Saturday, but they have had a deluge of rain and it means that that may well be in doubt. So we're going to focus our attentions at the top of this show to the all-weather action at Kemp and a little bit of Chelmsford as well. We will cover Kelso, but we're going to leave it to last in case it doesn't make it, essentially, to make listening and viewing to this as easy as possible. I get to do all of this, as always, in the company of Daryl Carter, Dan Barber and Tony Calvin. Let's come to you first, TC, because what is the likelihood of Kelso getting the go-ahead? If you read... um... The clerk, of course, Matthew Taylor on X, pretty pretty minimal. He said they'll need significant improvement throughout the day and they need to, tonight's forecast, which suggests another 10 minutes or so, he's, they want that to be wrong. So that's quite a related contingency double and it, it's massive. It's massive odds against, isn't it? Massive odds against. Okay, that's pretty depressing. Then, Dan, you were meant to be there, weren't you? Yeah, I'm weathering tomorrow, um, on Friday as that is, and they're they're inspecting as we'll be recording. So I might just pop onto another web page just to check that um as we go. Fair enough, fair enough. And Daryl, it's all weather action to the fore. Are you ready for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not all doom and gloom. Um no, no. but uh big week next week of Aintry. So I'm hoping if I can get through this weekend with it with a couple of winners on the all weather, I'll be it'll keep me going until the big action next week. How would you find the swapping, Dazzler? Because you have to do it more than you and T's have to do it more than I would, you know. Yeah, sometimes it can be refreshing. Like, like I said the other week, like the flat season seems to come around at the correct time. Really, um, I don't mind when it when it's decent, you know, above class three action on your weather. I can get I can get stuck into it some reliable form, but uh, when it gets mm-hmm. a bit of a lower the lower grade stuff, I, I tend to stay clear of it. To be honest. Yeah, um, I should just say before. Before we go any further, that next week, as Daryl's mentioned, we've obviously got Aintree as the main focus. We'll have daily shows for the three days of Aintree's Grand National Meeting. So really looking forward to that. We'll be covering all the ITV racing. Can't wait to get stuck into the big one as well. Exciting times just around the corner. And on this show, we're going to have loads of additional place races for you on Saturday. So keep an eye out for that. And also check your carousel for all offers that are available for you and those additional place races. There'll be loads going on there. Check them out. But of course, as always, with those offers, read the t's and c's first please and usual note of caution have fun with it this weekend but we want you to do it responsibly please got some fun feedback v fun feedback for once yeah somebody said that um if they can introduce some dan barbaress dad jokes into their own work they'd be a happy man now i thought i was a bit better than dad jokes to be honest so feels like a slightly backhanded compliment that you I thought think- I was dealing in really cut, cutting edge humour. You are stuck in that comment section, didn't you? you- <laughs> no, this is this is an email with a, a nice lad that was chatting oh. to. to. To confirm, you thought you were better than dad jokes. Yeah. Wow. Okay. What's our What's our engine sounds like a parrot? I don't know. A carrot. <laughs> Move on. Right. Okay. Well, that was fun. We thought we'd hit a low with the sheep chat on waiting earlier in the week. And now this is it. Right. Let's kick off over at Kempton. As I mentioned, we're covering the all weather racing first because we know this is going to go ahead, TC. And we are starting with the 205 at Kempton. It's the Snowdrop Philly States. It's a listed race. So it's nice and high class. We've got 10 runners as well going to post and really wide open as terms of the betting is uh, when you're looking at the betting, we've got many tears up at the top of the betting having a first run for James Ferguson was over in Ireland with Joe Lyons 3-1 to one. Um, Schwazia then is next at 9-2 to two, and Adelaide is over from Ireland as well with the Irish trainer Joseph O'Brien so plenty of Irish form coming into mix with some of our better British form TC which way did you sway? Yeah um, changed a bit over the overnight stage here with the 15-8 to eight anti-post favourite Novas not being declared um, and the other no, no show was a five to one shot as well. So the betting was shaken up a bit, but that would be good news for those who are, uh, got the fancy prices about many tiers earlier in the week. Opened up at tens, went to 13 to two, and then went to seven to two. So that's probably why the sports book are ducking in a little bit because obviously they've had a fair bit of trade on, on that one. You can fully see the case for it. Um, obviously, it costs a whopping 
300 grand out of Joe Lions stables in December. Um, Dundalk, she has got, she's the only one here with a penalty, but that Dundalk form, they could have rated higher than 95 on that because she beats uh, two 96 rated old of Hillies pretty handsomely there. So even though she's got the penalty, I think she's probably the right favourite. Um, you know, you can get bigger elsewhere. Uh, but yeah, I thought many tiers, stable going, going really well as well. I thought we had a lot going for it. If you're looking for an angle into the race, and somebody obviously did this morning, there's no real guaranteed pace here. So I thought Mysterious Love and Rose Prick were the most likely ones to go forward. The latter from stall three. She's been back from 40s to 20s already. We're recording this, obviously, as usual, at 3 o'clock on Thursday. So Rose Prick from the front, maybe, could be an angle there. Uh, still 20s. But, uh, yeah, I thought I thought Many Tears was the right favourite in there. Mad, isn't it? You mentioned her purchase price, 300 grand, right? Obviously, it's a lot of money, but she already had listed black type in the book, Daryl. And, you know, you see horses selling for 300 grand as yearlings that unfortunately never make the track or can't put one foot in front of another. She she may well look like value at 300 grand. Yeah, I know. It, it, just, all, it just always doesn't sit quite well with me when, when a horse like that it seems to be on the upgrade and then they want to ship her out or, or they're happy to, to let her go it just i don't know why it just doesn't sit well with me um so i'm going to be i'm going to be trying to take her on on this first start for james ferguson she may well be the uh correct favorite she may well win but i like uh i, I think the the obvious is sort of staring in the face a little bit here with joseph, joseph o'brien's adelaide with uh william buick booked um looking about in, in a couple of listed races in france at the end of last season actually ran really well career best on on the ratings and uh I think they're going to have a set up for this. I think they're going to have a ready to fire first time out, trying to ha- hopefully get, uh, get the scalp of a couple that may just need the run first time out and get some black type. She's very progressive without kind of winning. She now returns to Kempton where she won as a novice. That's the only victory she's got to her name. Um, so I, I assume that with the booking of William Buick coming back here, it's all sort of a little bit of a plan coming together to hopefully strike at the first time of asking. So she'll do for me. Yeah, and it, it's it has Kevin Blake written all over it, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> he wouldn't tell you, though. He wouldn't tell. No, you. no, of course he wouldn't tell us. No, God forbid. But we we know he's to blame for this addition to this race, isn't that right, Dan? Yes, um, I'm sure he's. I mean, he, he what his favourite race in the calendar is that Phil is listed juvenile hurdle at Aintree, isn't it? Just oh yeah, yeah, it's yeah. an opportunity for him to <laughs> nick some black type for one of one of Joseph's fillies over there. Uh, yeah. The point that Dan makes is quite interesting, actually. Um, and I just wanted to double check who the prior owners were, and it's those yellow color, yellow and green colours that we associate with with Jet Lions. So not like low spending owners, but I was that slight negative aside. I was minded to to go with her. Um, James Fergus, you know, we're hot this time of year. I'm always looking for stables that look like their horses are fit and that they're not behind. And the fact he's had 10 returning from a 90-day-plus absence since the 1st of March and only one has finished outside the frame, including two winners, four seconds, suggests that he's made a bit of a concerted effort that we're going to have our horses ready to go in the early part of the as what is the turf season, albeit this obviously on our weather. And when you've spent that amount of cash, it feels a bit of a statement to me. You've got a horse of that stature off JR Lions mm. and it's gone for 300 grand. You don't really want to be starting with a low key run, do you? So I can see the purchase price of Tara Race is a potential negative of it. And I think you can see a potential upside in the fact that they'll want to have her ready. She's obviously very effective on our weather. Good turn of thought. She was progressive. I thought she was the right favourite too. The one I didn't really like, even though on the figures you'd have her up there, was was Mystic Pearl. I just don't like that angle of parked off to Dubai, has a couple of cracks over there, runs in the balance sheet. And only six weeks later, we're expected to see her firing again back on um, without much time to acclimatise again back in Britain. So she was the one in the market I was most negative with and many tears was the one I was most positive about. That, uh, the Haggis first time pieces stats aren't very good. He's 26 from 170, which is for a trainer with his normal strike rate is modest. And just to back up what you were saying down there in regards to James Ferguson, I've been on course when he had those two novice winners, that nocturnal one, absolutely bolted up at Wolves. And then he had another one on Tuesday night as well. It was well-backed and bolted up in that novice at Wolves, beating a couple of Gosden horses. And obviously Danny Muscat was on them, both both those horses. 
And it was clear that, you know, Yard is forward. Yard is ready to rock and roll this mm. year. So it's definitely a positive in that regard in terms of the stable and just where they've got their stock at the moment on average. Let's move on to the 240, um, which is over the mile, three furlongs. It's the Rosebury Handicap. And in Tinzo, again, at the top of the market, it's a, it is a wide open market. We've got 14 runners, 14 of 14, and Tinzo is four to one. Old Herovian back from a very long break nearly a year off the track is four to one last seen on the turf at Newbury uh, sort of disappointing that day it's been off ever since Chillingham next best for Ed Bethel at 13 to two TC I shall start with you again here um, mm. this is surely a race where there's some there's got to be something away from the top of the market I, I, I feel that that's the angle here um if there was, I, I struggled to find it. Um, oh, okay. the, first thing, yeah. the first thing we should say is that uh, eight horses got batted out. There were 23 at the five-day stage and 22 got declared. Wow. So if, you, if you backed any of the following, uh, get your money back anti-post. You don't, on some firms, don't automatically do it. They are No Surrender, Mustard Seed, Anderleap, Winter Reprise, True Courage, Keto, Rafgar, Robusto. So if you back any of those anti-post, you're entitled for your money back. Um I I was originally going to side with Chillingham, uh, but a couple of things put me off. Now, he's got a lot going for him. Um, one first time out last season, stable are going well, and he's only a pound higher than when just touched by Pridwen. And obviously, Pridwen's now 11 pound higher. And that, in that Wolverhampton race, the third, fourth and fifth of all one since as well. So I think he's really well handicapped, but... What worried me is they haven't got the tongue tie on that he wore for that really good Wolverhampton run. And, and I, I was hoping we were a bit bigger than sixes as well. Um, very boring. There was a few. Uh, if this, obviously, you can give a chance to all of these. But I thought Intenzo at five to one with the sports book is probably um, it's my idea of the favourite. And I thought there might be some little bit of juice in his price at five to one. Nothing major st sticks out for me. Um, was looking at kind of like you, full king, but I was hoping he'd be better drawn than ten. A uh, lot of pace in here, but I thought Intenzo, if he gets the run of the race from one, I thought he really went at Wolverhampton last time, and I think an eight-pound rise might not stop him. But yeah, a five to one to top price around as well. Okay, Intenzo then for TC. Uh, Dan, we'll come to you next, I think, here. Yeah? yeah, okay. Um, Youthful King, the horse that Daryl mentioned, gave a good nod to at Lingfield last week. He ran a massive race from a bad position, but... He looks a Lingfield horse, doesn't he? Sort of really well suited to the way those races develop. It doesn't tend to really happen here unless you get a bit of a pace collapse. It's not. It's more about stamina than speed, isn't it, compared to Lingfield. The flat time gurus have been purling, purring, should I say, about Old Herovian, but it's a nearly 11-month layoff and returning a tongue tie. There are potential negatives. Um, and there's a potential negative, I suppose, with Intinzo, because I don't actually love stall one on a horse that's not going to be going forward. They'll probably just sit in touch, and so it could lead to some trouble in running. But I think his all-weather record, two really impressive wins where he's shown a turn of pace. The defeat in between reads perfectly well. He's got a really strong ascot form on turf from last season. He's had only a handful of starts since a debut success. He's really got a pedigree to work with top connections. I think he probably is one of those who's going to develop into a pattern class performer the way he took care of them at Wolverhampton. And provided he gets um, a clear run at things and doesn't get bottled up up the inside, cut away, the, the cut away trademark, as we um, as everybody mm -hmm. likes to refer to it at Kempton, um, that may well be crucial for his chance. But I agree with Tony that all things being equal, it's five to one, four to one, I, I'm... I wouldn't be averse to backing this horse at threes, to be honest. It's, uh, there's there's loads of pace in there. There's seven out of the 14 like to go forward. So hopefully that'll play in his favour. And we should also mention there's four places for each way punters here mm. as well. So Daryl then, it's over to you. Dan and TC with Intinzo. I honestly didn't think this was the way this conversation was going to pan out. Are you going to make it all three in with Intinzo, the market leader here? No, I'm going to be with old Herovian. Um oh. I, I actually really liked the way he ran in the Al Ryan Stakes at Newbury. He was very free early on. Uh, he was still there at the business end to uh, come to finish. That was a huge step up from a run-of-the-mill novice at Wolverhampton. Uh, he's obviously two for two on the all weather. He's uh, he's um, gone well fresh before. I know the tongue ties a slight concern. I suppose that's the first thing that I sort of went, oh, 
Don't know about that, but the fact that Oshin's on, uh, the fact that he's gone well fresh, I, I think a mark of 93 considerably underestimates him. I don't think you can say that about too many others in here. Uh, I think he's he's got the potential to be a good ten pound ahead of the handicapper. So hopefully they'll have him straight first time. Just a touch on you, Full Key. I've been with him the last twice. He's been drawn in the car park the last twice at Lingfield. Done remarkably well. But uh, as Dan said, I'm not sure. I, I, he looks like he wants an extra furlong, but he's normally a horse that goes off from the front. So he's only been held up because of circumstances. They'll probably try it again here, but I think he'll be vulnerable to stronger stayers um, at the finish. But he's a horse to keep on the right side of when he finally gets a bloody good draw. Uh, because he hasn't had the last three times. So Old Horovian for me. Okay. Old Horovian then off the break. Uh, let, and don't forget that 240 is an extra place race. Let's move on to the 315 over the two miles. Stayers handicap, the Queen's Prize handicap, two miles at Kempton. Um, Sweet Fantasy is currently at the top of the market, three to one. Novel Legend, seven to two. Aquam in here, eight to one after that. Spirit Mixer, eight to one as well. Small favourites here. Uh, but Sweet Fantasy back from the Hurdles campaign, which has obviously been beneficial to her. She had a couple of wins over Hurdles, Dan. How is that going to convert back onto the flat now? Where do we think we're at with her for James? Yeah. And another really interesting Oh, in dual purpose performer, yeah, uh, undoubtedly. But at the same token, everybody's he's just alive to this now, aren't they? They're just alive to what a good trainer he is. He had um, that winner. He had a winner at Wolves the other night with that stayer that's been with Joe Tizard one over jumps. Oh uh, yeah, Tamaris, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. Well done. And he's got that now, and he went, you know, won on the flat, and then they're going to go back hurdling, chasing all sorts with him. Just love. Yeah. Him. Uh, yeah, he's really good. I remember chatting to him at Aintree back when he, the big lens won, and he was only just sort of making a ripple then, but he got all those Gredley horses, and this is another one, of course, now. So I like the fact that he's getting dual-purpose animals. That's that's the hope with him, that he's going to be a, a a really important trainer in getting good flat horses to bring over jumps. But I don't think the market has missed him. The one I was minded to go for, and you've got to do a bit of joining the dots, is Spirit Mixer. Um, obviously we've not seen much of him at all he's been out only twice in two years or so but you go back to his his sort of relentless progress he was making as a turf and or weather horse a couple of seasons ago that culminated with the second Chetrushan in the Northumberland Plate um, clearly the standout piece of form in this race I don't think there's any question about that you've got to go back to 2022 for it he then missed nine months returned at Musselburgh track probably wasn't ideal and he then missed another 11 months big price in his return I suspect that they had bigger fish to fry than that Linkfield handicap when he was a big price and he missed the break and then you've got a sheen taking over from the claimer that normally rides him I almost feel like this is D-Day for him this is the day when if he's going to recapture something like the Northumberland plate form, where he was second to Trushan off 97, it might be in a pretty valuable handicap at Kempton, back on an all-weather surface, where he's managed to find himself on a mark a pound lower. So quite sweet on him. I know there's downside, he could blow out, but I thought his win price was too big anyway. Interesting. Okay, well, Daryl, you were with um, Balding Horse in the last race, Old Horovian. He was spirit mixer here, or can you see the angle with it yeah. here? Yeah, Dan's hit the nail on the head, really. Um, okay. I thought it was a fairly eye-catching run at Lingfield as well. I didn't think he was given too much of a hard time. And I'm no paddock judge, but just watching him sort of go around the track there, he looked like he was tying up a good deal for that run. Yeah, look, I don't want to repeat what Dan said, but he's bang on. Um, the other one I was just going to have a small cover on was going to be Circuit Breaker, who was formerly in the Spirit Mix of Colours, but he's with John Joe O'Neill now. Um, this horse comes here with a tongue tie off the off an 190 day break. We haven't seen him since he was chasing home Urban Look at, uh, at Haydock last year. I didn't think Hector Crouch made enough use of him that day. He's a horse that will just stay forever. It seems massive, isn't he? Yeah, he's <laughs> a massive galloping type. The, the 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 angle with him is I'm hoping that he's going to pop out from store one and he's just going to get on the front end and just sort of keep rolling because I don't think he's a quickener, Dan, is he? No, he's just a big. I'd like to, uh, he's gone to John Joe. He's a horse I do want to see going jumping next season. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, he's one of the course. I just thought there was definitely more to come. He crossed the line, still were running left, I thought, behind Urban Outlook, who's gone well up in the weights after chasing over Lordship next time. A horse me and Dan both like last year. 
Um, I think there's scope for uh, for uh, improvement off his mark of 89. He's very lightly raced. If he can get well positioned under James Doyle, I think he'll be there or thereabouts for a very small each way bet. But the main play in the race will be Spirit Mixer. Okay, and then Circuit Breaker getting that handy little mention. Currently 12 to 1, having that first run for John Joe. TC, last word to you with this. Who else would you like to throw in here? Yeah, just very quickly, another race where there are horses balloted out. So if you're back to valuation, Jeremia or Tenerife Sunshine, uh, you get your money back. Uh, if you played anti-post, uh, load of pace in here. Uh, counted six of the 14 at forward goers. So um, hopefully that will play in the favour of Duty of Care, who's drawn 14 of 14. Uh, now, that's not ideal, but like I said, I think I think the pace angle is will work in his favour. He was he was drawn thirteen to thirteen when he ran at Newcastle last week, and he didn't have any chance of, of coming from off the pace there from where he was. He he rumbled on into six, um, and, he, and he didn't have a he didn't have a, an easy race there. Uh, so that worries the quick turnaround worries me a bit. So I'm going to play duty of care win only. The, the case for him is pretty obvious. It's, it's back to his favourite hunting ground at Kempton. I think most of his better efforts have been over this course and distance. He's a dual course winner. He finished second to Bandonelli in this race off a two pound high mark last season. Uh, yeah, and I just he just returned to Kempton off a falling handicap mark, um, and hopefully there'll be a bit of a pace collapse, and you won't see him till late um, here. But uh, yeah, duty of care. Uh, I'll probably play and win only because I'm a bit worried about that turnaround. But uh, any double figures for duty of care, uh, I think, is, is the bet in the race. I couldn't believe how much of a free time they gave Pride and up towards the front end last week at, at that Newcastle race. So it, it threatened to be one of the all time days on the pod, didn't it? When you back, when you put up the first winner at double fingers, <laughs> and then my, mine quickly went downhill after that. Yeah, mine much, mine, mine, ugh, mine went much better. <laughs> onwards we go guys let's stay positive let's not look back let's keep looking forward that's what we like to do on this show um let's bounce over to chelmsford tc because we're going to cover uh, the condition stakes race at 3 30 over the mile it's a road to the kentucky derby it's a class two it's for the three-year-olds and it may well make it onto itv if kelso doesn't get the go-ahead so we'll take a look at it it's a spicy little contest and we've got nade the brian runner at the top of the market, six to four Capulet uh, over from Ireland, had the three runs last year as a juvenile and now coming here for the reappearance. Interestingly, he's got a runner in this. Uh, Cuban Tiger for the Carl Burke operation, the second best in the betting, nine to four, been on the go so far this year to great success. Those are your top two in the market. Um, is this a race that's interesting, UTC? Yeah. Um, credit to the BHA for but acting swiftly this morning, they they saw that Utoxeter and Kelso are massive odds against uh, mm -hmm. to go ahead. So that would have led to Kempton on its own. So they moved Kempton for uh, Chelmsford forward from an evening meeting to an afternoon meeting, and uh, it seems like they're going to put uh, the three thirty on ITV if Kelso goes. I suspect we'll also get the alleged stakes at the Curra on ITV as well if if Kelso does. Uh, Bite the bullet, but oh, just um, goodbye to Weatherby there. By the way, it's been abandoned. Right, okay. Um, hey, Weatherby. Okay, you'll have a. You get um, this far out. You get seventy-five percent of your fee, don't you, Dan? I think it's. Um, I think that's. If it's, not, a, if it's, it's the day before it's seventy-five. It's two days or more before it's fifty, isn't it? I think <laughs> it's not to be discussed on a podcast myself, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 obviously you can see why the Royal Lodgeford Capillet is the favourite and you can see why Cuban Tiger is the second favourite because even though he won narrowly last time, um, I think he won a bit snugly. He was, they came to him and he went again. So I think there's a bit more in the tank than Cuban Tiger. But I think Orm's just the wrong price at five to one. Now, I don't back each way in dead eight races 48 hours in advance and I probably wouldn't do it until about the morning of the race, but I suspect the fives would be gone by then. But I think Orn's just just the wrong price. Um, he's obviously he was well beaten by Cuban Tiger at Newcastle last time, but he's five pound better off, and he did he did a lot wrong that day. Um, pulled a bit too hard as he as he's mindful to do. Switched him outside. They switched him inside. He only got racing late. Now, no surprise they put first time cheap pieces on. Uh, first time cheap pieces for the yard. 
is not betting juicy. I think they're nine from 80 since 2017, so nowhere near the usual strike rate. But you can see you can see why they've gone for some headgear, whether it be the hood or the cheap pieces. They've gone for the cheap pieces. And I, I just think on his, on his bare form, on his previous Lingfield run, um, I think Orn is overpriced at fives. I, I can see him starting at threes. And the, the pace angle is interesting here. I mean, he has made the running before when he won the Horace Hill, but three others like to go forward as well. And, and um, yeah, I think Orn's overpriced. I'd, I'd have him more threes than fives. Okay, on with those cheap pieces. It's interesting a- angle when he does have that tendency to be a touch keen. I wonder if they could go either way with him, but I suppose that's the experiment they're trying with. Uh, Daryl, have you taken a look at this race? Yes, yeah, I have. Yeah, on I, I could like Tony. I can see why they put the cheap piece on him. Obviously, as you mentioned, being keen is a slight concern, but he looked very reluctant under a bit of pressure at Newcastle last time. He did shape though that he would come on, like sort of come on for the run. It would look like a rusty performance, so I expect an improved performance from him. I think Capulet is a great price at six to four. I really expected this horse to open up at the shade of odds on. Went off favourite for the Royal Lodge last year, narrowly beaten by Ghost Royer. Stayed on at the finish there. That's easily the best form in this race, in my opinion. Um, and and I thought he should have won at Leopardstown the time before but behind Diego uh, Valaquez. I thought, uh, I mean, it was a little bit of a talking point at the, at, at the time. With Jamie Heflin sort of put his stick down and uh, I really yes, thought he should, it's coming back to me now it was a yeah tournament. I thought he should have won that day I thought he came out looked the best horse there um, first time at Newmarket perhaps didn't seem to best effect in that Royal Lodge but he stayed on very strongly this is nowhere near that level for me I agree Tony with Tony Orn is the, the one to give me most to think about but if he's straight first time under Ryan Moore I think he'd take a world of beating very very surprised he's as, he's as a 6 to 4 shot and not a short of a 10 to 11 on shot Dan, does that mean that we're missing something with Capulet coming over for this? Like his price, Daryl obviously thinks it's a generous price at this stage. I mean, are we missing anything here? Well, the only thing I could think of is whether people are happy to lay on the basis that he's probably got bigger targets and the Guineas presumably is one of them, one of the early classics, something like that. No? Uh, Um, uh, They were talking about a derby trial for him. I haven't spoken to Ryan. I don't think I'll be doing a column with him, but if I am... I'll, uh, I'll let people know, obviously. Um, but yeah, I think they were they were talking about a derby trial for him, and they're talking about City of Troy being the being the solo going to the Guinness. And I just All think right. he might be more of a stayer down the line than a mile. Yeah, he's out of assisted to Serpentine, isn't he? Remains the flukiest derby winner I've ever seen. Um, <laughs> uh, Blue Lemons and Brackens laugh the two horses whose names begin with B and L. They they've got prior form as well. They've um, they met each other and Bracken's Laugh won on debut at Newbury. Blue Lemons was third, but giving six pound away for the uh, penalised for the debut success. But that's not even part of my thinking anyway. I'm going to take those two out of the equation. And fraught with dangerous, TC always says, eight are declared, you just hope all eight run. Um, Burger Masco I was going to put up each way at tens. Now, that could be crazy because... There's a chance the Dundart race isn't worth anything like as much as it appears, but there's no way from the race developed that it looked a fluke. And the horse of, of Aidens, who finished, who was odds on favourite and finished last of the three, has since come out and finished fifth in the UAE derby. Bergamasco stepping up from a handicap, tanked all over them, showing how effective he is on our weather, because he's won at Dundart multiple times and just showed a really good turn of pace. So, I think he's in such good form and he's fit that he's going to give his running again. And I think that might be enough to have him in the three for sure. And he's 10 to one. Q, okay. one being withdrawn and him finishing third. Yeah. Just your luck, Dan. Just your luck. Mm. Okay, let's bounce over to Kelso then, of course, with the asterisk that we do not know if this racing is going to take place. And if you're listening and watching right now, it may well already have been abandoned. But if it is going ahead, then please stay with us because we will cover the ITV races and we will kick off with the 150. And of course, the ground is going to be heavy if it gets the go ahead. The 150 is over the three miles too. It's going to be an absolute slog for the handicap hurdlers in this. And you've got major fortune up at the top of the betting, 15 to eight currently with Betfair, uh, looking for a sixth win on the bounce for the skeleton team and the question is Tony Calvin are you with this big improver or are you against him um, obviously conditions are going to be absolutely brutal if it does go ahead um, like I said already water legged in places and 
10 mil more to come. And there's a, as I said, there's a bit of, bit of rain knocking around on Saturday as well. So you might not know till Saturday morning whether it's going to go ahead. If it does go ahead, you've got four places in this race. Um, the one that interests me were Prince de Fischo. Uh, now, he was on the three mile two handicap chase later on the card, but he would have been out of the handicap here. So they're taking advantage of the fact that he's seven pound lower over hurdles and he's over fences. Now, that's for a reason because all his best form is over chases, but coming here off the back of an Ida, um, obviously very deep ground, stays a lot further, which is a big positive. I thought, obviously, I'm not a big fan of the uh, ex-champion jockey, but I thought the 14s, four places was was fair if uh, the race goes ahead. Prince de Fischo. Uh Dan, mm-hmm. I know, I mean, I feel like it's just, yeah, will it go ahead? Who knows? But who will be able to cope with as TC uses the adjective brutal conditions best in here? Um, well, Major Fortune's been handling them with a plum. I mean, where does his rise end? I mean, he's won five in a row. We've seen with Santos Blue doing us a good turn at the track last season that Dan doesn't like to waste his bullets and he probably would have won with Lemire loss had Harry not gone for home so soon, also at the track last season. He doesn't want to waste his Kelso bullets because yeah, it costs a few quid to get him up there, doesn't it? <laughs> um, but he's won five in a row, keeps doing it by these narrow margins under unbelievably confident rides. The Lingford race was a joke. I could have run faster than them for the first mile. And then they sort of sprinted throughout the back end of the race and he just, confident ride, got there, under hands and heels. He's gone for it. He must have been one of the best handicapped horses around. He won first time off 79. Go back to his time with Tom Lacey. He finished placed behind fairly useful horses in two bumpers. I don't think 112 is anywhere near the ceiling of his ability and potential. And his effectiveness on bad ground is a massive, massive plus. I am going to save on one, though. And it's a horse who also revels in the mud, who Daryl's been with lately a couple of times. Uh, Fleur, um who ex Gordon not as not very consistent nowadays, but the run two starts back against Curly Finger, who was absolutely thriving, is really sound. And I just think that Utox to race will prove very strong for him. He got beaten 40 lengths, but some credit to the fact he still beat 12 others in a 17 runner field. It was dominated by improvers. Gwenny May Boy ended up winning it. This just looks slightly easier. And yeah, you chance him at a big price. You don't touch him each way, probably. It might have um, just come too soon as well that you talked to the race. Yeah, it was only two weeks off. He's had, what, three three or so now? Yeah, I think exactly three to recover. So I thought he was a potential runner because he normally runs in much better races than this and goes well in the mud. But yeah, I thought Major Fortune at the bottom of the weight stood out quite a lot in profile. Right, let's move on to the 225 then. Over the two miles, five furlongs, it's Handicap Hurdle and Air Street is your market leader currently. We've got another full field of 16 here, TC, and it is a wide open market. Air Street for Jackie Stephen, uh, looking for the three-timer. Kilter in there for the Sam England Yard at 6-1. to one. North Parole has had an excellent season for Sue Smith. It's been a bit of a headline horse for her. Those are your top three in the market. But as I say, wide open here. Yeah, um, we've got five places with the sportsbook at the moment. Uh, there's three double entered uh, due to run on Friday. If those go ahead, I suspect those five places will come down to four with those three non runners. But even so, um, Faithful Flyer is twenty to one, and even with a, a, a small rule four, I think I think that's a very good price. Twenties um, ran a lot better last time at Musselburgh. Um, down to a mark of a hundred now. Uh, he's got good course form. He's he's won he's won uh, one of his three starts there. Finished third in the other two starts, and he's one from one on heavy. So stick that all in together in a very very um, moderate um, race uh, with the extra places. I think Faithful Flyer at twenties, even with like I said that small uh, reduction factor. Faithful Flyer for me each way. Okay, big price as well, despite, as you say, might get down to the four places here. Uh, Dan, you next in here, please. Yeah, I suppose the question with um, with Air Street is where will the progress end? Um, uh, but I, I honestly thought I'd, I'd have a, a real sneak. It's an excellent here. question, Dan. It's it actually is. An excellent question. <laughs> uh, the, the, the progress of the horse I've got to put up, which I honestly thought I've got a lively one here. Nobody else will be putting this up, and Tony's just... <laughs> Solo selection. 
<laughs> he's, jo- he's joining the same dots as me with Faithful Flyer. Ah, um, 20 to 1, both of you. Bloody hell. I, I just think this is this has been the plan now. Two, two months break. He ran perfectly well when I was there on his return over the wrong trip, two miles. He travelled well through the race. It was behind Bois Gilbert and Autumn Return. Autumn Return reposes and he's seven pounds worse off. But it, it's less about those weights and measures with that horse. It's more about the fact that he revels in the mud. He's yet to have it this season. Musselburgh wouldn't necessarily... I, I certainly don't think around 19 furlongs would net on good to soft ground would be a, an optimum test for him. Yet, as Tony said, he did run better behind Welsh Charger last time. He's 20s, he's dropped down to 100. His win at Kelso last season was was really impressive of 92 and he held his own afterwards, got touched off back at Musselburgh, but it was three miles that day at Musselburgh um, by Curly Finger, who we know what he's gone on to do. He just got a reference early in line with with Fleur in the, in the staying handicap. So, yeah, I didn't think we'd be parking our cars in the same garage, TC, on this, but we definitely are. I think he's a... He's a proper lively one at 20s plus. Yeah, the the, the only slight nagging doubt, the, the form of the Sandy Thompson yard is uh, is not great. A very small sample, but his last few runners have run like drains. Yeah, I suppose the question is, when will his progress begin again, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> the horse, that is. Okay, okay, on we go, on we go. Daryl, let's bring you back in here. You're my favourite anyway. Uh, <laughs> Two furlongs, the handicap chase. Just the five runners to pose for this. Another slog, two shots of tequila, two to one, five currently. But does he know your pal, Daryl? Oh, yeah. Or did your right turn at Doncaster when we last saw him? Ended up going off at a huge price in the Grimthorpe of 20 to one and bolted in for you, essentially. Well, not quite, but, you know, we'll give you the hype here. 20 to one. Are you with him again, Daryl? Yeah, do you know what? I, I kind of am. Uh, it was a tough race he had that day. That uh, he's up five pounds, but this is uh, this is all, this is an easier task on paper, mm. isn't it? Um, he's going to go off out in front again, I assume. He's it's only his second start in, in the cheek pieces, which I thought really helped in that day. Kept him, kept his head nice and straight um, going forward rather than side to side. He's a classy horse, and uh, his class just might be able to get him through. I know it's a big weight in, in, if it goes ahead and, and it's going to be horrendous conditions, but he's got such a good attitude, this horse. And if he's recovered from that, and it looks like he has to going up to Kelso, then uh, then I think he, I think it'd be tough to beat. I, I very much respect two shots of tequila. He's probably got a bigger effort in him off a mark of 130. But I think your own story is prepping for a Scots National, and I'm not sure Bally Coos is up to this level. So, yeah, I kind of would. It, it wouldn't be, you know, you back him at sort of 10s and 14s and 20 to 1 last time. You've asked to back him at 5 to 2 or 5 pound high mark. It's a bit difficult to do, but this is another good opportunity for him, I think. TC, two shots of tequila is carrying 10 4. Does he know 12 stone and in heavy ground, which is what it can only be described as if it does go ahead? It's going to be a huge weight difference between them. And there's only the five runners. So, are you having a bet in this race? And if you are, how are you playing it? Yeah, um, it's cut up massively this race. There was 13 in it on Monday. It's now five. Uh, it would have been four if Warwick had gone ahead today because your own story was due to run at uh, Warwick today. Um, I'd, I'd have two shots of tequila over Does He Know. Um, this will be, this, this will be the, the most attritional ground Does He Know has, has run in. Um, so, yeah, I'd be with him. Elvis Mayer, is, to me, was the obvious one uh, earlier in the week. Um Obviously, he's got really good course form. He's on the same mark as when beating Highland Hunter and Burroughs Diamond and Empire Steel and Koresh Rambler here in October. Won this race by seven and a half lengths last year. It's a heavy ground winner. I just thought Elvis Mao was was the one earlier in the week. I think, still think the current price is, is okay. But the more I look at it, I mean, like I said, we've lost eight runners from mm-hmm. Monday and your own story is the same price. And obviously, he's very, he's due to go around two pounds in future handicaps, but he's very closely handicapped with a favourite on their run last time. Uh, yeah, if you ask me at the current prices, which is what we have to deal with um, doing this podcast, I think your own story is overpriced at seven to one. I don't think the markets has adjusted to the fact there's been so many non runners, uh, withdrawals. Even. Okay, interesting. Your own story then for TC at the current prices, as he has highlighted. Yeah. Um, 
Daniel, have the boys mentioned either of your any a, a selection for you? Are you with the boys? Yeah, they have. Um, unlike those, two, I couldn't really have two shots of tequila. I just, I think he's a poor price. I don't, I just don't think he's a strong enough stayer to win a race like this. He he travels strongly, gets delivered late. It's all right doing it. It was Newcastle on soft ground in a three runner race. Prior to that, it was Catterick on heavy, where he basically won it because he's a strong traveller. He's at. I can see him absolutely wilting on the likely conditions we're going to get at Kelso with, you know, a horse like Does He Know trying to run the finish out of everything from the front. I came back and held this mail. Now, Gladiators has come back to TV and made a storm in return. I'm going to bring the form figures back, if I may. This is Elvis Mail at Kelso. 4-1, 3-1-1, 2-2-2, 4-3, 1-1, 3-1-1, 2-2-2, 4-3, 1-1, 2-2-2, 4-3, 1-1, 3-1-1. He's so dependable generally. But he's mustered around here. They always target the track. He loves the mud. He doesn't put much pressure on his jumping around here, which has let him down at tracks like Cheltenham since that that really good return. I think he's generous. He's ended up on the same mark now as he was first time out of one four three. And I thought he was guaranteed to to give his running. Um, I mean, how many Nick Alexander horses haven't performed this season? He had a remarkable time, I think. So mm-hmm. I thought he should be um, closer in the betting to the other two. I am most fearful of does he know because he's just got that class edge and if he's on a going day, he could gallop them into submission. But I thought Elvis Mail at nearly twice the price was too big and I thought two shots of tequila was a bad price. Yeah, you mentioned that, Nick Alexander. I, the horse was also in at Carlisle on Sunday. So I got I uh, I got in touch with him on Tuesday to see what race they were going to go for. Um, and he kindly got back to me. Like I've never met him in my life, so... I hope he does win because, like I said, he's. Uh, I think he's going to be the next NTF president, isn't he? Uh, Nick All right. He seems. He seems a. Well, he seems a very kind of like personable guy. So he's very bright. Which way he does win? Mm. Yeah, good guy alert. So that's five runners in that race, and we've tipped up three horses. So fingers <laughs> crossed we have a winner, boys. Um, right, 335 at Kelso over the two miles. It's for the Mayors, the Mayors Novice Handicap Hurdle. And it's the double green that have got the domination of this at the moment. Brucio for the Crawford operation, seven to two. Lily de Burley again for them, six to one. Shake Your Tail Feather is next best at six to one as well for the Skelton Yard. Uh, Dan, I will come to you here first. A uh, bit of Irish form coming in here, obviously, from those Crawford horses. But of course, we've seen them plenty over here as well. And how do they stack up the two of them in here? <laughs> yeah, part of you think so they're running one to keep the weight down for the other, but I don't answer. I just think there is such a massive class edge for Brucio that Bru- showing her form might be enough. Um, I mentioned Gladiators. Brucio Forsyth was a big figure, wasn't he? Ninety game shows as well. Um, Never liked but- him. Yeah. Creepy vibe about him. Good guy, good guy. Good guy. Um, <laughs> you see, not just dad jokes, is it? <laughs> <laughs> bad impressions too. Uh, there are four of them out of the handicap. Um, for one, loads of these are just sort of fair handicappers. Whereas Brucio, yeah, she's she's paid for it in the handicap. She's got to give sixteen pound away. But the Leopardstown listed form is. Mm-hmm. I mean, some some of these would be absolutely tailed in that race. She was able to win it. I think the class will get her through in this. Okay, so top of the market then for Dan. TC, do you think that they've got a hill to climb to beat this Brucio, given the form that she's bringing in? Um, at the current prices, I'd probably have the stable mate, uh, Lily de Burley, at sixes over uh, Brucio. Um, yeah. we, obviously, we, we might find out a bit more, but... Uh, could have bumped into one when beating the odds on last time by Sweet Fantasy. Off a mark of 116, looks uh, looks very generous on on her graded performances um, last year. So probably won't be having a bet. But I thought Lily de Burle, uh four places six to one was was a very fair price. All right, so we've got a nod for the double green then, favourite and second favourite. Daryl, who did you side with here? Yeah, you're gonna love this. Um... I, if this race goes ahead, I'm just going to back both the Crawford horses and sit back and watch one of them win. Okay. <laughs> I just think they're so far clear of anything else in this race. I think it's outrageous, really. Uh, the, the race that Lily Bur- de Burley ran in at Catterick last time, that was a really weird race. Like, sweet, sweet fantasy. They just gave that horse a, an absolute freebie from the get-go. And it was almost like Daryl Jay was like, hold on, we better sort of try and get close or do something here. It was the only one that went to chase the horse but was obviously tiring late on, having been off the track for almost a year. She's dropped four pounds for that. 
And that was definitely just a just a spin, uh, just to get the fitness fitness back into her. She's much better than 116, surely. JJ Slevin coming over is is a good pointer to the fact that they think she's better than, than that mark as well. And Brucio did a really good number on my clock at Leopardstown um, when beating Minx Tiara. It was only Bally Byrne that that beat her circuit time, and she went off at five to one for that uh, for that. Um, was it the more battle? Was it? No, what was it? The Kelsey. Premier Novice. Premier, Premier Novice. Novice, yeah. She went out just five to one for that, giving, giving some support um, during the day. So I obviously think she's capable. Ben Bromley claims five. Or, it's very difficult to choose between them. Um, at the prices, I'd happily back the pair of them, honestly. Okay, so basically it's just double green all the way yeah. for the camp then. Uh, TC, did you want to mention the alleged stakes before we do naps? Uh, no, I did. I did have a look. Obviously, we've got White Birch returning in that race, but there was no prices uh, when I looked no. just before the podcast, so no real point. No, okay, fair enough. But of course, that no, was- nobody priced it up. Not just the sportsman. It was just yeah. like because nobody's expecting it to be on ITV. So when it's not expected to be on terrestrial television, nobody tends to price it up till Friday afternoon. Got yeah, it does look like it could be an intriguing little event though. So we'll look forward yeah. to that on Saturday as well. Um, we will probably be discussing it on Monday on Wade In, but in the meantime, we need to get your naps, guys. Uh, whilst I give you a minute to think about what your naps are, don't forget, listeners and viewers out there, you've got those extra place races we've already discussed. Lots of big fields to get stuck into this weekend. Also, check your carousel for all the offers available to you and do read the T's and C's when you do that, if you are getting stuck in. And of course, before we go any further, use Betfair Safer Gambling Tools. Loads of people already do. Those deposit and loss limits, uh, profit and loss tracker. You can set time checks as well for gaming. Uh, There's plenty of options for you there and they're very easy to find on the Betfair website. Right, naps, please. Uh, TC, I shall start with you, please. What is your nap? Uh, duty of care, three fifteen, Kempton. Thank you, Daryl. Your nap. Capulet, three thirty, Chelmsford. Ah, lovely. Dan Barber. Uh, well, I'm going to do it twofold because if Kelso's on, it'll be Elvis Mayo. Yeah. If Kelso isn't on, it's Spirit Mixer, three fifteen, Kempton. Head to head with TC. Okay, great. All right, look, boys, good fun as always. Where will his his improvement end? I do not know. <laughs> that is the big one here, guys. Um, have a good weekend, team. Enjoy it. Let's fingers crossed that Kelso does get the go ahead because otherwise it'll be a little bit of a quiet weekend and there is good racing up there. So pray for that with the weather gods. But for now, everybody out there, thank you very much for listening. That was Racing Only Better.